Good morning, everybody. It is great to see everybody here, and uh, I want to welcome everybody, especially our visitors. I know Steve mentioned we do live in a beautiful part of the country, and as a result, we get a lot of folks passing through on vacation, and we're incredibly glad uh, that you've decided to worship with us this morning. I've got two quick things I want to mention before I get started, and I know one of them has already been said a couple times, but Miss Pat, uh, it is great to have you back, and it's not just that you're here. If you haven't noticed, there's no wheelchair, there's no walker. Uh, it was just her legs uh, that carry her in here this morning. Um, so we are glad that you're back home here with us this morning. Uh, second thing, Sandy, I think I owe you an apology. So last Sunday, if you were with us, I preached from an Old Testament book that had a really long name. And I didn't think that every time I said that word, she has to spell it out. And I think I said it... <laughs> about 20 times, if I'm not mistaken, last week. And I am going to say it once today, so I will pause after I say it, though, all right? Uh, if you have arthritis one day, you can file workman's comp, I guess, as a result of that. <laughs> so several years ago, uh, there was a TV commercial that ran. Uh, it ran for a long time. I don't remember seeing it recently. It was for a kid's cereal, and kind of the claim to fame of this cereal was they had no sugar, no added preservatives, but their tagline was this, kid tested, mother approved. And so some of you already know, I'm talking about Kix cereal. And it was really smart because the marketing team recognized that the key to their success was gonna be mom's approval because ultimately, more than likely, mom would be the one that would make the final decision on whether or not that cereal would make it in front of the kids. And you know, I love that tagline, kid tested, mother approved. And the truth is, throughout our lives, we seek approval from a lot of different things, don't we? A lot of the things we buy have to be approved before they can ever make it to us. And you and I, whether it's in work or school, we seek approval from teachers and our employers and other things. But honestly, at the end of the day, through it all, only one approval really matters. What really matters in our lives and what you and I ultimately are seeking is God's approval. I invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Psalm 15. Psalm 15, and, and we'll spend the bulk of our time together here. And, and what we're going to find in Psalm 15 is a Psalm of David. It was either written by David or to David or for David, but it is known as a Psalm of David. And it's a psalm that speaks to the character that is needed of an individual in order to have the stamp of God's approval. And before we dig in, though, I think it's important to understand the type of literature that we're dealing with here in Psalm 15. Because the Bible is a fascinating book. It's made up of several different types of literature within itself. Certain parts of the Bible are narrative or story in terms of a type of literature. Some parts are historical in nature. What we're dealing with here in Psalm 15 is known as poetry. Now, when I say that, maybe you're like me, and my extent of poetry is this. Roses are red, violets are blue, and then there's several different possible endings, right? So my experience with poetry is it has rhyme and rhythm to it. But that's not Hebrew poetry. You see, Hebrew poetry is different. A lot of times what you'll find are parallel lines that complement each other where one line might state something and the second line will repeat it for emphasis or maybe it expands on it to offer more force of the statement that's being made. Sometimes the two lines contrast each other. And we're going to see that displayed in Psalm 15 as we go together through this particular psalm. Let's begin by noticing, though, the question that's posed in verse 1. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? And actually, we'll go ahead and pose the second question. Who shall dwell on your holy temple, holy hill? So these two words, the idea of sojourning in your tent and the idea of a holy hill, we need to stop for a moment and try to understand what would that have meant to David? What would that have meant in the life of a Jew that would have read this maybe for the first time? The idea of a tent. I guess for most of us, we would probably go to camping, but you see, 
That's not the idea for a Jew originally. Go back with me to 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 17. As the Israelites are celebrating the Ark of the Covenant returning home, you see the Philistines had defeated the Israelites in battle and they had captured the Ark of the Covenant. And now the Ark was returning back to Jerusalem and we read these words in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 17. And they brought in the Ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. If you were with us last week, we talked about the tabernacle and what it represented in the life of the children of Israel. And when David uses the word tent here, or when the word tent is used, it's referencing back in the mind of the Jews to the tabernacle. What were they celebrating upon the return of the ark? Why was that so special? You think about the ark of the covenant and how it was constructed. These two cherubim on each side that faced each other and looking down, you see it represented God's presence. And God's presence was coming back home to Jerusalem. And it was going back into the very tent where God's presence would dwell. Last week we talked about the division of that tabernacle. There was the outer courtyard and then the first entrance was to the holy place. And then the Ark of the Covenant resided in the Holy of Holies, the, the most sacred place. Only entered once a year on the Day of Atonement by the high priest. So we see this idea of a tent, and then we see the idea of a holy hill. What does that mean? What does that have reference to? Again, we have to think about a Jew that was living at the time of David, or even a first century Jew. Where would their minds have gone? That word holy hill refers many times in Scripture to Mount Zion. The Temple Mount, the very place where the temple would ultimately reside in the city of Jerusalem. The permanent structure that would take the place of that tent, the tabernacle, where the ark would reside in a more permanent way. You see, the question being posed here is not really who's going to live in this tent, the tabernacle, or who's going to live in the temple. The question is, who can approach God's presence? Who can be in God's presence? And there's two words that are used here that I think are important. The first part of verse 1 says, Who who shall sojourn in your tent? That word sojourn. It's an interesting word. What it actually means is a resident alien. Now that word, unfortunately, has a lot of political influence in our society today. But here's what the word means in God's eyes. It's someone that's given a special place because of a gracious host. That's kind of interesting to think about, isn't it? A sojourner. Someone who was not originally a resident or someone that had original access maybe to all the rights of a certain place. But because of a gracious host, they're taken in. They're given full benefits. They're given all the rights that that land or that place has to offer. And the, the, the poetry here, the psalmist says, there's somebody that has special rights, that gets to, to be in the very presence of God. The second part of the verse says, who shall dwell? That word dwell carries with it the idea of being part of the family. You see, it's not just the interest in the passerby that just wants to casually experience God in living with Him. It's about somebody that wants to become part of the family, that wants to be in the community of God's people. Man, that's a powerful picture, isn't it? Who gets to dwell? Who gets to be approved by God to be in His presence, not just as a casual participant, but somebody that's given full access because of the graciousness of God, that gets to be a part of His family, that gets to be a part of the community of God's people? You see, that's the question posed as this psalm opens up. And the rest of the psalm is going to help us find the answer. So let's see. God approves those who, first of all, have the right character. Let's look at the very first part of verse 2. Who's the one that's going to be able to dwell on the holy hill or sojourn in the tent? 
He who walks blamelessly and does what is right. That word blamelessly. I don't know where your mind goes when you see that word, but I think it's easy maybe to think about perfect or without fault. That word blamelessly really connects back to the idea of without blemish. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, as the Israelites are held in captivity in Egypt, they're slaves and have been slaves for several hundred years. God has already demonstrated His power through several plagues, but there's one last plague that will ultimately set the Israelites free from bondage. And it's the death of the firstborn. And special instructions were given to the Israelites on things they had to do. And one of the things they had to do was they had to get a lamb and they would take that lamb and they would eat it. But notice to the instructions that were given to them about that lamb. That lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. That word without blemish, same word we find here, the idea of blameless. But then look with me at Psalm 119 and verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the way of the Lord. That word blessed doesn't just mean happy. It means who is the one that God is going to look down and approve of. And the psalmist says here, it's going to be the one who walks in the way of the Lord. And how is that person described? Blameless. Maybe an individual that helps illustrate that for us is found in Genesis chapter 6. And that individual is Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9, Noah is described as blameless. Now again, what does that mean? Does that mean that Noah was perfect and without sin? Absolutely not. Noah was a person just like you and me. And none of us sitting in, in this room have the ability to say that we are without sin in our lives. But can we be found blameless in God's eyes? And I believe the answer is yes. What did that mean? It meant that Noah with everything he had in him, tried as best as he could within his power to live in the way that God wanted him to live. Did he still make mistakes? Did he still give in to sin from time to time? Absolutely. But his intent in life, his desire was to walk in a way that pleased God. That's the idea behind the word blameless. And the psalmist says, those that want to be God approved, those that want to live in God's presence are those that walk blamelessly and then it almost defines itself immediately after that and does what is right. You see, there's just a standard of character that the God-approved person is looking to, for in their lives. They want their character to be aligned with God in every way possible. They're trying to the best of their ability to see God and His standard and say, I want my life to try to measure up to that. That's the first thing we notice. The second thing is this. They have the right speech. Look at the second part of verse 2. It's not just that this person walks blamelessly and does what is right, but he speaks the truth in his heart and does not slander with his tongue. I guess you could say there's two aspects to this idea of truth. First is positive. He says he speaks the truth in his heart. Truth is just a part of God's character and His nature, isn't it? God is truth. Jesus would say, ultimately, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus was nothing more than God personified on earth. Jesus demonstrated God in flesh, His nature, His character, everything about Him. So truth is just a part of God and His character. And the person that wants to be approved by God has a desire to have God's character. So truth is going to be fundamental. But where does that truth reside? The psalmist says in his heart. What does that have to do with? It has to do with the inner part of man where reason and logic and thought dwell. We might say in our mind. The Proverbs writer would say in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 to guard your heart with all vigilance, because from it flow the springs of life. You see, what originates in our mind is ultimately going to flow out in our actions and in our life and everything about us. 
And that's why truth is so fundamentally important as a part of our character in the same way it is for God. But there's also, we could say, maybe a negative side to this. It's not just that truth resides in our heart. It's what comes out who does not slander with his tongue. You see, the God-approved person is not going around looking about what they can say about somebody else. Gossip, being a busybody, even speaking the truth, if it's intentionally going to harm somebody, it's just not a part of the character that makes up a person of God. And so it's not just the right character, it's also the right speech, but God also approves those who have the right conduct. Let's pick up up the second part of verse 3. And does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. You see, how, how we treat people matters. I think it'd be good, and I told you, Sandy, I was going to say this once. Turn to Leviticus chapter 19, and we will pause You see, God cares about how we treat people. And He's always cared. He cared about how the Israelites treated people. One of the things I love about the Psalms, I believe if you look at the Psalms, the one theme, each individual Psalm stands alone by itself. You see, it's a collection combined into a book, but each one just stands alone on its own merit. But there's a theme, I believe, that runs through all of them. And it has to do with relationship. Specifically, relationship between God and man. That's at the heart of the Psalms. And God has always cared about relationships, about the relationship that we have with Him, but also the relationship that we have with each other. So look at this book in the Old Testament that I just said in chapter 19, beginning in verse number 9. And notice the instruction that God gave in regards to how they treated others. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. There's our word again. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. And you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So God gives specific instructions here to the Israelites about how they should treat each other. And do you notice how many of the things that we've already seen in Psalm 15 are mentioned here in Leviticus 19? But it's not just how they treated each other. They also had a responsibility to those that were not part of the Jewish nation. Stay in that same chapter and look at verse number 33. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You see how they lived amongst each other, the conduct that they had with each other mattered, but it wasn't just how they treated each other. How they treated the strangers 
the sojourners matter too. Why? Because they had been strangers and sojourners one time before. And even the invitation to come into God's presence is an invitation to them as sojourners to come dwell in a place that in and of themselves they have no right to even be. But yet God, because He's a gracious host, gives them all the rights and benefits, even the ones they don't deserve. So you see, their conduct mattered. But God approves those who also have the right values. Look at verse number 4. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. Who's a vile person? How, what does the psalmist mean here? You know, I think it's easy sometimes that we can just throw around phrases or words and we allow culture to define maybe Bible terms and Bible words, but that's not how it should work. Right? You see, God had a purpose for the words that were used in Scripture. And they had meaning to the original audience. And we can't understand that until we try to understand what it meant to the original audience. And what's intended here is the idea of those that just ultimately, willfully choose to defy God. They choose to have a lifestyle that says, I'm not going to have anything to do with God. In fact, I'm not even going to recognize God's existence in essence. And they do that through their actions and the way that they live. So the vile person in God's eyes are those that have no value for Him in any way whatsoever. They just disregard Him in their choices and in their lives. And unfortunately, as a response in terms of how we live, our responsibility is to look at people in the same way or, or look at events that people choose to engage in in the same way that God does. You see, God can't have anything to do with sin. And so those that choose to willfully engage in sin, we can't have a part of that in the way that we live. We have a part of it in the way that we share Jesus, in the way that we engage them. There's nobody that we don't share Jesus with, but we can't participate in our lifestyle and in our actions with those that willfully choose to deny God. Instead, honor should be given to those who fear the Lord. You know, a lot of times we look for heroes in our lives, don't we? We want people that we can emulate, that we can look up to. And we look for heroes in a lot of different places. We search for people that we want to be like. And we use all these different criteria. And the psalmist says, you want a hero? You want somebody to emulate in your life? Emulate those who fear the Lord. Honor those people. Lift them up. Look to them as examples of way to live. And those are the people that you should follow. So they have the right values. And then God approves those also who have the right integrity. Look at the second part of verse 4. Who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Does what's right all the time. He stands by his word or her word no matter the consequences. Doesn't matter if it hurts. Doesn't matter if it cost him or her something. The God-approved person has integrity and does what is right and stands by his or her word and does not change. There's no wavering. They're consistent in their actions. The person that God approves when they give their commitment to something, they follow through every time. It's not changed by circumstances. It's not changed by anything that the world might throw at them. They're just consistent. In addition to the right integrity, though, they also have the right stewardship. Continuing on in verse number 5, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. You see, the Jews were given very specific instructions. If they had somebody within their community that was in need, they were instructed to loan money, but they could not charge interest to those that were in need. So you see, there's this responsibility to take care of, to give, but to not make a profit off of those that are in need or hurting. 
In addition, they don't take a bribe against the innocent. They're not looking to get wealthy off of other people. They won't hurt other people in order to make a profit. We might say this about this section, people matter more than money. That's not always how society has worked, has it? It didn't even work that way in Jesus' time. You think about the church in Acts chapter 2 in Acts chapter 4. One of the ways that the church is described is generosity. They were selling their possessions. They were giving to those in need. And as everybody watched what was happening with this group of people, they were astonished. They couldn't understand it. Why? Because it wasn't the societal norm. It wasn't being done within Jewish culture in the way that God intended it. And now when the church is established and these group of people that have been impacted by Jesus start to change the way they live, people take notice because people mattered more than money. So the psalm began with a question, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? And we've just looked at a whole list of characteristics that will give that individual to be God approved. But then this psalm ends with a statement, a solid foundation. The psalm says, He who does these things shall never be moved. You see, the person that wants to have access to God, that wants to dwell in God's presence, if they practice these things to the very best of their ability, the psalmist says, they are steadfast and firm and will not be moved. And here's what's interesting. It doesn't change with culture. This truth was written literally thousands of years ago, and it's just as true today. It doesn't change with circumstances. There's a thing known as situational ethics that is prevalent and has been now for many years that basically says what's right or wrong is determined by the circumstances that you find yourself in. Something might be wrong here, but it might be okay in a different circumstance. And the psalmist says that's not true. That the God-approved person stands firm and their firmness in these attributes doesn't change based on circumstances. And it doesn't change with difficulties. Life gets hard sometimes. It's not always easy to have integrity. It's not always easy to hold our tongue and not say something to other people. It's not easy to not put money first sometimes when pressures, financial pressures, bear down on us. It's not easy to look at other people and put their needs before our own. But here's what's fascinating to me about this whole chapter, this whole particular psalm. This psalm was written in a time in history where all the Israelites had in terms of their worship were animal sacrifices and a priesthood that was flawed because it was made up of people. But here's where I'd like for you to end with me this morning. In Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to notice how how you and I have this access to God. Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, and we need to stop right there because that word therefore is referencing something that's just come before it. And the Hebrews writer has been giving a whole series of thought based on Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And that passage is quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 8. And that passage deals with a new covenant, but here's a fundamental principle of that new covenant. And it's found in Hebrews 8 and verse 12. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And now in chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through the flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, 
not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Do you notice some of the similarities from Psalm 15? The, the idea of entering the holy places. What's that talking about? It's entering God's presence. It's entering His throne room. How do we enter it? By the blood of Jesus. And as a result, you and I have access to this new and living way that's been opened by His sacrifice. And what did we say the Psalms had reference to? Relationships. Relationships between man and God, but even relationships between each other. And the Hebrews writer here talks about this incredible relationship that now exists between us and God, where we have access to the very place where God's presence is, the place that even David himself didn't have access to. And in addition to that, we've got these confidences and these things that we can be assured of, and then we have a responsibility to each other to encourage each other to not quit, to not give up. Is it hard to have these characteristics to be approved by God? You bet it is. It's not easy. I wouldn't even say it comes naturally. That's why God had to leave these instructions for us. It takes effort. It takes intentionality. It takes work. And sometimes you get discouraged. Sometimes you may feel like you want to give up. Sometimes we may ask, why? What's it worth? And that's when we come together as God's people and we encourage each other. We remind each other of the truths found in Scripture and the fact that we're in this as a community in God's very presence, dwelling with Him with the ability, even through our imperfections by the blood of Jesus, to be approved by God. And as a result, we don't quit. We don't give up. We keep trying. Some days it's literally one foot in front of the other. Why? Because the sacrifice that was given for us is worth it. It demands our effort to the very best of our ability. This morning we sit here together as a group of imperfect people with the ability to be made perfect by the blood of Jesus so that we can be approved by God. The very least we can do is respond to Him by trying to have the right character and by trying to deal with people in the right way and by simply showing the love of Jesus with each other and with the community in which we live. This morning, the invitation of Jesus is offered to all of us. The sacrifice He made on that cross is available to every one of us this morning. If you're here and we can help you know more about Him, if we can share more of Him with you, if we can encourage you in any way, if you're hurting and just need to be prayed with, we'd love to help you, we'd love to pray with you. We'll encourage you in any way that we can. Just let us know how we can help while together we stand and sing.